Welcome to Conversation with a Geographer. I'm Mike DeBevo, Professor of Geography at Grand Rapids Community College. And today, we're very fortunate to have Jennifer Devine, Associate Professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Texas State University. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're very, very happy that you are able to overcome this, this COVID pandemic. It's been two years we've wanted you to come here, and finally, we're able to, to make this arrangement. You'll be speaking tonight, and uh, we're, we're all very much looking forward to this. Well, you know? yeah, thank you so much. It's been a long time in the making. It certainly <laughs> has. And um, I guess one of the first things I, I, I'd like to talk about is, uh, is, is childhood, background, what, uh, what might you reflect upon, perhaps, from your childhood or, or early days in Washington that convinced you to become a geographer? Yeah, that's a great question and one that I like to talk about. Um, so I grew up in Yakima, Washington, mm -hmm. which is a predominantly Hispanic community, um, agricultural community. And I always loved Spanish and uh, Mexican culture. And so I had an opportunity to go and do a study abroad mm -hmm. in Mexico and Costa Rica for a year in between high you? school and college. I was in Veracruz, Mexico, mm -hmm. and then outside of San Jose in Costa Rica up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a wonderful experience. At the same time, I was really shocked by the poverty and the inequality that I saw, particularly in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I grew up um, in a single mom household, and we worked hard to make ends meet, and I considered myself sort of working class or even maybe working poor, and that experience really opened my eyes to global poverty. So I came back to um, Yakima Valley Community College, and I wanted to study international development. Mm -hmm. Eventually, after community college, I went to the University of Washington, and I thought I wanted to be an economist, but I walked into a geography class, Dr. Vicki Lawson's Geography of Inequality class, and the way that she was talking about poverty and inequality made a lot of sense to me based on my experience in Latin America, and I've been a geographer ever since. Well, she must have been very inspiring to you then. Well, certainly. She certainly has uh, left a strong legacy. Yes, 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 indeed. Were there any other uh, faculty at UW that uh, influenced you strongly in geography? Yes, um, Dr. England as well in the geography department. Mm -hmm. And I also had an opportunity to work with um, the, the Women's Center for Democracy at the University of Washington. I got to meet the, the famous Nancy Hartsock. She's a feminist political scientist. Mm -hmm. um, and with her and some other women activists engaged in politics, I had a chance to go to Cuba in 2002. And that, that was, was my introduction to international political economy and really thinking about the role of policy in all of this. And um, I did have a chance to meet Fidel Castro. Really? <laughs> yes. Uh, our, our delegation was accompanied by Senator Cantwell, Maria Cantwell of mm -hmm. Washington State. Mm -hmm. Washington State in the early 2000s was renegotiating treaties, agricultural treaties with Cuba, which is one of the exceptions to the embargo. So I got an, an introduction to the, the world of politics, and um, that was another really influential experience that I had. They got me thinking about how to influence social change, both through thinking about economic models that work best for the most people, as well as the role of politics in the economy and in environmental conservation, which I care also very deeply about. Was it that experience then that really piqued your interest in geopolitics to a large degree? And, uh... Yes, and I would also say complicated my understanding of things. Um, <laughs> as a person who had lived in Mexico and Costa Rica and seen what um, those countries looked like in terms of poverty, I think I sort of thought Cuba was going to be dramatically different, and it was in some ways. Um, but before I had the chance to meet Fidel Castro, I got to meet a lot of people living ordinary lives, and I learned about the authoritarianism and the lack of freedoms and 
So I left with more questions than answers in terms of what is the best model to promote sustainable development and address poverty at the same time protect our civil liberties and the important role that democracy plays in all of that. So yeah, it got me interested in politics, but uh, the work that I've been doing since then has really been trying to think about what are the models of development, political, economic, and conservation models that work. And it's certainly not mainstream development in Central America, and it's not the form of development that characterizes Cuba. So that set me on the course to my PhD research, really, working with grassroots initiatives. Sure. Yeah. It, it compels one to realize, I guess, that there's no one-size-fits-all. There's no one-size-fits-all. So by the time I had a chance to, to meet um, Fidel Castro, mm -hmm. you know, I really didn't know if I wanted to take advantage of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a really wonderful experience. But I will say, and we've discussed this previously, um, I had a wonderful experience at the community college level. And I really attribute a lot of my academic success since then to the great education and mentoring that I got at Yakima Valley College. That's, um, that's an important reinforcement, I think, many people who are viewing this will, will want to hear because the uh, community college does provide that environment that so many uh, other institutions that might have uh, more prestige do, do not. So, so you, left, uh, you left Seattle, and then what did you do? I was fortunate to get a Marshall Scholarship to go and study in the UK for mm -hmm. two years. I spent the first year of my Marshall Fellowship um, in the Gender Development and Globalization Program in the Gender Institute, and I actually had had little introduction to issues of gender, although I considered myself a feminist. Um, and the second year in my program was in the Geography Department, and this is at the, the London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. Both of these programs were at the LSE in London. So the first year in the Gender Institute, the second year in the Geography Program. And that was also a really wonderful introduction to some high stakes politics and political players and getting to meet people and learn how um, these things work. Because oftentimes, as a first gen person from small town USA, you know, we don't get first hand experience of how these diplomatic activities work and, and how politics functions. So I learned a lot about um, the UK's approach to development, DFID, their international development organization. LSE also has a fantastic development studies program. And I was able to think critically and carefully about development models with really excellent bureaucrats and politicians from all over the world who came to the London School of Economics for the same purpose. You know, it's, it's interesting. LSC has a very distinguished reputation in the world of geography that many Americans don't really realize. Since Dudley Stamp served on the faculty decades ago, uh, it has, has really gained uh, great distinction. And there are a number of students that have um, gone to LSE to complete doctorates in geography from other countries. I have a number of colleagues, for example, in South Africa that have pursued their degrees there. Did you happen to um, meet with many uh, other foreign students that were not Brits? Yeah, most certainly. It's a wonderful multicultural environment. And um, not only with students, but professionals mm -hmm. um, in the graduate program. I remember distinctly having a Pakistani bureaucrat in one of my gender development classes and just learning from his firsthand experience. It was really valuable. Um, I did have the chance to work with Stuart Corbridge, who is another great geographer, mm -hmm. development studies person, which is, I think, one of the subfields I would identify with. But I would go even farther than just the LSC. I think many folks don't appreciate how important geography is a discipline, not only in the UK, but in, the, in Europe more broadly. Indeed. And so, um, in some ways, uh, it makes sense that the LSC is a leader, but I think that that probably um, is, a, is a characterization of, of many UK universities where geography continues to play a really important role. So um, 
I was interested in staying at the LSC, mm -hmm. but maybe in part because of the wonderful mentorship experience I had at the community college level. I was wanting to come back to the U.S. system because it's a bit hands-off. Mm -hmm. And one thing that happens when you get to a really prestigious place, and the faculty are really well known and very busy, is that as a student, you often don't have that type of connection, time, and uh, intimate relationship with your fellow students, with the faculty. And I really wanted to, to have sort of a more community, based approach, a bigger network of students and faculty. So I decided to come back to the U.S. rather than to finish my Ph.D. at the London School of Economics. Had you decided to pursue the Ph.D. immediately upon completing your master's degrees? No. I came back to the University of Washington and mm -hmm. was able to get a job uh, with the Office of Global Affairs. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to sort of get some real world experience and make sure that I wanted to do a PhD. And I was fortunate enough to work on a project that was looking at the role of global health and global health institutions and its impact on Washington State. So our I mean, project the was of Washington's been a leader. the University of Washington, yes. but then, of course, you have the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. as well, uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. There's a lot of international poverty alleviation organizations that are there, PATH, Program for Applied Technologies in Health. And so I got to organize and manage a research project looking at Washington State's global health resources and the role that that sector plays on the economy. And it's a, it might be a little bit um, of, a, of a sort of side, uh, a sidestep here, but um, what motivated me to come back to do my PhD was that I was spending a lot of time as a manager and administrator on this project prepping ideas for methodologies, gathering data, and um, the PhDs on the project got to come in and just sort of make big decisions and bring their experience to the table without having to attend to all of the administrative details. And I looked at my colleague and I said, I want, that's what I want to do. I want to be in that role. I'm not a very good administrator in terms of um, keeping up with the details that an administrator needs to do, a project manager needs to do, sure, human sure. resources. I like thinking about problems, thinking about methodologies for addressing problems. And then uh, luckily I was able to be accepted to my graduate program and I said, I don't think I'm going to regret this opportunity, even if I choose not to go into academia, I'm still going to go have mm -hmm. a wonderful learning experience and gosh, you know, make my mom proud getting that doctorate degree and making up for all of those family members of mine who didn't have a chance to go to college mm -hmm. before me. So um, I did move to University of California. I lived in the Bay Area and had a wonderful graduate experience there. And uh, can you talk about your graduate experience in terms of your, your mentor and others that influenced you and the faculty as well as uh, other graduate students? Right. Well, um, you know, the, the biggest resource that I had at UC Berkeley were my fellow students. And they, that's still true today. And I was told that coming into the program mm -hmm. that what you're really going to value coming out of the program is this network. Mm -hmm. And, and it's very true. I had the opportunity to work with uh, Jillian Hart and Michael Watts as co-chairs on my project, and they were fantastic. And uh, while extremely busy, mm -hmm. every single meeting was so productive, and they really helped me develop the theoretical and methodological frameworks that I use today and we'll be talking about later tonight in terms of how we understand the ways in which places are connected, um, the role of development and capitalist development, and also finding solutions to some of these most pressing problems that challenge a part of the world that I care very much about, which is Central America. Speaking of challenges, can you reflect just for a moment on some of the tasks your mentor might have put before you that were quite challenging, quite formidable. 
and just comment on one, perhaps, that maybe you thought you weren't going to be able to do this or you had reservations about it or? I think whether you're a bachelor's student doing a thesis or an honors degree or you're a master's student doing a master's thesis or a PhD student doing a doctoral dissertation, the most painful time that, that creates existential crises about why am I here, why am I getting a graduate degree, why am I getting an undergraduate degree, is trying to come up with that project and that project proposal. Mm -hmm. And I really struggled, to be honest, to find what my dissertation was going to be about. And I think it was because, in part, um, I misunderstood the role that the PhD dissertation plays in one's career. I thought it was supposed to be your magnum opus. And I think I was not being realistic about how important it is for a project to be feasible, to be doable. And so I had a lot of challenges right before my field work, mm -hmm. figuring out what my project was going to be about. And I wasn't entirely sure about all of that. And I went to the field. I went to Guatemala. And I collected probably too much data, but eventually found my way to my topic of my dissertation, which focused on the territorial politics of tourism development in post-war Guatemala. And so I found, I found my project, but it was a bit painful. And part of it was that I put too much pressure on myself, too much expectations. I didn't fully understand the scope of the dissertation needed to be more narrow than what I had imagined. So if there was a time in which I faced a lot of challenges in the PhD program, it was trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do. And uh, now I teach graduate research design and methods. And I like sharing that personal experience with my students so that they can come to understand that their graduate research is really their license to drive, right? It's not the magnum opus. It's not the culmination of what the best work you'll ever produce. It's demonstrating that you can design a research project, have a methodology to answer that question, gather data that becomes evidence, and then bring that back to contribute to theory. And you need to see your research project as part of a larger research trajectory. And that holds true not only for people who want to go into academia, but for professional geographers who want to work in city planning or water resource management. I tell them, you know, the dissertation or your thesis in this case, and we even have directed research projects at the master's level at Texas State. We have master's degrees de designed for professional geographers. Um, I say you want your projects to illustrate to your potential employer that you have the methodological toolkit as well as a grasp on the literature to be able to continue to do this type of work. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's, it was a hard lesson learned, but one that I'm, I'm sharing with many students that I work with and helping them think about their projects in terms of their longer career trajectories. It's an, it's an interesting dilemma, I think, for, for many graduate students in this country and postgrads and uh, doctoral students in, in, in other countries where there is this notion that the dissertation or there the PhD thesis research must be a magnum opus. Yeah. And I wonder if that is one of the reasons why 50% of those that are advanced to candidacy fail to complete their doctorates. It's just a thought I have. I, I think, think it's what you're true. doing is very valuable by instilling within your students that no, this is not going to be the be all end all story. Right, right. And so take that pressure off. That's too much pressure for a project. I think it's also interesting in terms of geography careers and the question of grad school. When I was um, in grad school and even in my PhD, I never considered a non-academic career path. And uh, now that I'm you know, 20 years out of my first graduate degree, not so long on the PhD, um, I really see the contributions that geographers with doctoral degrees are making in multiple fields. And I think that if we could better communicate 
the work that we can do as professional geographers outside of academia, that it might help some of those students who really struggle with the dissertation component um, to push on through. And to be honest, you know, I sort of thought, oh, people who get PhDs and don't land academic jobs, it's because they weren't able to do so. Mm -hmm. Because it's a cutthroat game, uh, and their jobs are few and far between. Requires oftentimes that you move anywhere in the country or even the world to land a tenure track job. And a lot of people aren't interested in those types of sacrifices. And I sort of thought, oh, I'm going to do this, and you know, it's the only option I have, and this is my goal. And now that I've had an opportunity to collaborate with USAID, mm -hmm. the World Wildlife Fund, um, there's so many amazing nonprofit organizations, and all of these people, all of these organizations are really hungry for what we as geographers bring to the table in terms of, yes, our geospatial technological skills, but the fact that we integrate social and environmental analysis. So I think the future of geography is bright, and we want to help geographers see their graduate training or even an undergraduate degree as having the diversity of applications that it does. Um, we'll be talking about this a little bit later today, but I think it's a great time to be a geographer because so many of the world's most pressing problems require both social science skills and environmental, physical science skills, and what our bread and butter, at least for me as a geographer, is that uh, we bring together both social and environmental analysis, right? Absolutely. I and couldn't have said it better. So if it's climate change, <laughs> if we're talking about international migration issues, if we're talking about global inequality and poverty, I think that these are all really pressing problems that geographers um, have a lot to offer in terms of their contributions. And I love my job and I love academia, but I really see myself moving forward making a bigger effort to engage in public scholarship, to do more collaborations with non-academics, to get academic research translated into the popular press so that we can share uh, our understanding and our approach to many of these problems, which I would argue differs quite a bit from the ways in which other um, disciplines within environmental science, biology, for example, um, or even the social sciences, which maybe don't bring in ecological processes and environmental change into their understanding of society, right? At least not with the same analytical toolkit that geographers are able to provide, or good geographers are able to provide. We, um, we do have a knack for engaging in cogent problem solving in a way that other uh, practitioners in other fields, of other fields, uh, do not. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we are able to communicate with those practitioners and engage in teamwork to uh, resolve a lot of social and environmental problems that are, we're finding out more and more, intertwined. Especially social justice and climate change, for example. Exactly, exactly. And uh, one of the things I really appreciate about geography is that for many of us, uh, we take an inductive sort of ground up approach to addressing these problems. And um, I work a lot with economists. I, I dabble in economic theory. Political economy is one of my specializations. Mm -hmm. But what frustrated me about those intro economics classes was that it was very much sort of abstract models about how to develop uh, developing countries' economies. And it was very sort of deductive, and you have a model of how things should work, and you rove the world sort of looking for a case study that meets this mm -hmm. ideal type of what a model should look like. By contrast, and this is in large part to you know the great um, education I got from Dr. Hart at UC Berkeley, she really insists that we ground ourselves geographically and historically in the nitty-gritty messiness of life 
to think about developing models that might be exported or provide lessons from elsewhere. And it's complicated. And it's complicated. And it might mean that there's not a one-size-fits-all model mm -hmm. for climate change mitigation or indigenous land management or women's development. Um, but it's more effective. Uh, in my opinion. When in those particular places, your uh, unique model is being applied, for sure. Right. So I have come to this question of sustainable development and conservation in Guatemala, not by sort of looking at economic models or sort of a checklist of, a checklist of required variables that might be outlined in a development project, but sort of really taking on board what are the geographic and historical specificities of Central America that shape the way in which conservation can really unfold and be effective? And uh, tonight I'll be talking to the World Affairs Council about how conservation models that have their origins in the United States, our national park system, for example, that believes that the best way to conserve the environment is to create wilderness preserves where people are not allowed to live or work, that's the way conservation was implemented in Central America with disastrous consequences. That model of separating people from nature and using a powerful state with a lot of resources to implement and enforce that law has been disastrous. So in Central America, the national parks that should be the best conserved with the exception of UNESCO World Heritage mm -hmm. Sites, which get tons of money to make that happen, have the, the highest deforestation rates. And protected areas where communities are allowed to live and sustainably extract resources and play a really important role in implementing the rule of law, providing security, denouncing illegal activities. Those are the areas that have the best conservation outcomes. So to understand how to develop conservation models or approaches in Central America, you've got to get your feet wet. You've got to understand the role that the decades-long civil wars of the 20th century, how that contributed to weak democratic state institutions, and how those institutions have found challenges in terms of resources and political will to defend a national park, to protect a national park. You've got to get people involved in conservation. That model doesn't work everywhere. Indeed, when, when, when the residents in a particular community are given license to act as stakeholders in the enterprise as opposed to merely being the thorns in the side of the administrators in the government, or even much worse, more, threats. Oh, indeed, much. Or much enemies more, of conservation. Much more can be gained, and unfortunately, there is too often little dialogue that engages, or that is engaged in between those living in the community and those policy makers and decision makers. I, I've seen this in sub-Saharan Africa frequently, as well as other parts of the world. So yes, it's it's, it's very unfortunate because yes. The U.S. model is not applicable to everywhere in the world. I'd, um, I'd like you to comment on, on relationship building in your field work, because one of the things that has struck me is that one cannot really develop a solid model for a particular place in terms of, uh, of development unless there is an adequate length of time given to developing relationships with the people and with the landscape. Yeah. And it, I always found it surprising when I was doing my PhD research um, in Central America that the expertise of anthropologists and geographers were not drawn upon more explicitly. And so oftentimes what happens is you'll have a consultant doing a development project who will come to a community and do a diagnostico or an assessment, mm -hmm. a diagnosis of the social and economic and political relations that might implement <laughs> project implementation. But this is something that takes a long time to learn, and it takes a lot of trust to really understand the power relations within a community that I can, can either make or break a conservation or a development or a women's empowerment initiative. 
So um, the way that this looked for me was I had a fantastic field experience mm -hmm. in my dissertation. I lived in a community of 300 people called Carmelita, Guatemala, in the Maya Biosphere Reserve. It was created in the early 1900s by uh, Chicle Tappers for the Wrigley's Chewing mm -hmm. Gum Company. And I learned all about the historical labor relations and chicle production and chicle extraction and how it created class relations within the community and how those class relations from chicle extraction in the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s fed directly into this current moment of conservation in the Maya Biosphere Reserve. And when you have someone who doesn't understand those intricacies within the community, it's almost as if they're doomed to fail from the outset because they don't really understand why people aren't willing to collaborate. They don't really understand why there are these tensions over land and resources. And so that expertise and that familiarity is central. And what it meant for me as a geographer, because I know you love to travel, I love to travel, um, I got to hang out and get to know people. Mm -hmm. And again, channeling uh, my mentor, Dr. Hart, she said to me, you've got to become part of the furniture, meaning that you've got to become part of the landscape. You've got to become um, somebody that becomes familiar to get past those sort of um, lack of relationships, the lack of familiarity. And so what I did um, in my field work was that I started to teach English uh, in the community. And actually, I went to the community and I said, hey, I'm a doctoral researcher. I want to study community forestry and community-based resource management. And they said, what are you going to give us in return? Mm -hmm. Time and time again, they have seen sure. People come and get graduate degrees or undergraduate degrees and they leave and they never come back and it almost can feel like extraction, you know, it can be extractive. So it's about not only getting to know the communities but collaborating with the communities and wondering how is my research going to benefit you? How can my time here in this community benefit you? And so when you start teaching, you start volunteering, um, people can see that you're really invested in that place and it's critical to successful ethnographic research in particular. Yeah. That's, that's very profound. I think, again, that uh, relationship building that facilitates trust is very important and you found a way to do it with regard to providing English instruction, which is great. Um, and also returning to the communities. Yeah. And you know time what? And again. Time and again, Good and what they, and yeah, and what they also asked me to do, especially with the links with drug trafficking. I didn't go to the My Biosphere Reserve to, stu to study drug trafficking. Sure. The communities told me that drug trafficking was one of the leading threats to their social and environmental justice movement. And um, had I not had that trust, I wouldn't be here today talking about the environmental impacts of drug trafficking uh, with the World Affairs Council tonight. Sure. So um, it's, it's critical. Yeah. Um, we, we only have a couple of more minutes, and I'd just like to ask you to comment on uh, your role as uh, associate professor at Texas State. How do you manage everything in a very diverse department, really, Really, with, with a, a, a very diverse and large undergraduate student body, kids at home, how do you do it as a young mother with so much set before you? Can you offer advice to other, <laughs> others in your position? Well, um, I don't know isn't a good answer, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I think that you need to find a way to do what makes your life enriching and makes you happy. And so I have learned to focus my efforts on things that are both going to be productive for me and my university, but also the communities that I work with. Um, so I've narrowed my focus. I also want to say that you can have a family, and not only in academia, but in any career. And if that seems impossible, it's probably the institution that needs to change mm -hmm. rather than you rethinking your life goals. 
So we all have a lot of work to do to make not only academia but other professional um, circles become more family friendly and allowing us to live healthier, more balanced lives. Um, then again, my kids are going to be doing some field research with me here. Uh, they're learning Spanish. They went to Central America for the first time. I'm just kidding, but uh, you know, my love for that region and my passion for that region is a family affair, and it's hard work. I don't think I always do it well, but I always come back to this idea that we need to change the institutions when they don't seem to work for us and our families rather than the other way around. Agree. <laughs> Jennifer, thanks so much. Thanks so much for joining us finally after a couple of years and just bringing all you do to the field of geography. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure and I, I'm happy to get to know Western Michigan. It's a really beautiful place. So thanks so much for the invite. You're certainly welcome. And this concludes Conversation with the Geographer.